It says, you have been scheduled for evaluation on December 30th. 30 is the blood of Christ. December is the 12-month perfect government. Please report to such and such. Your attendance at this evaluation is mandatory. The, the court will be notified immediately if you fail to appear, subjecting you to possible legal sanctions. Maybe you ought to call a guy out in Wisconsin and get some advice like, oh, I think you know I'm saying you don't need me down there. Just do whatever you want. Beep. <coughs> says, if you are unable to keep your appointment, please contact as soon as possible, sincerely, and then a secretary. Now, um, that evaluation department also wrote back to the court by basically letter rogatory. It doesn't go into the public record, but it went back to the judge and said, Dear Judge, I received your court order on such and such on October 20th for a competency evaluation. The order also states that the report be completed and returned to the court in 45 days. However, I am requesting to the court that this guy's uh, court date be continued in order to allot enough time for said evaluation. The next available appointment is December 30th, with the written report done by January 16, 2004, unless something unforeseen happens. Thank you for your time and consideration in this matter. Now, the judge at the bottom of the letter that came back to him privately put a notation granted. So it's like a marginal order. All this is appearing on the private side. See, nothing goes on in the public side of the court until everything is settled on the private side. Now, they may have times, but on the private side, everybody is honorably telling each other what they're able to do. And the judge isn't throwing a hissy going, excuse me, you sucker, I'm the judge here, and you're just a psychiatrist, you've got to work this guy in. They're all being extremely honorable, and so, likewise, our hero, Dennis, ought to be honorable and be accepting all of these. He's going to come down and assist in whatever way he can. Okay, now enter the guy in the black dress. Okay? This is State of Delaware Department of Justice. And he's writing this to... Um, maybe we'll find out in a minute who this guy is. But it's another private letter, but it's part of the court case. And on the bottom of the letter, copies are being sent to all of the parties involved in the court case. So these just are all private letter rogatories going back and forth behind the scenes, trying to position everybody for what's going to happen on the public side. And it's going to depend. They're not going to hold a hearing on the public side until someone is in dishonor. When someone goes into dishonor, then they're going to hold a public hearing and it's going to be a debtor's exam for the one who's in dishonor to show up and explain why he's not treating everyone else <coughs> courteously. Understand what's going on? Very simple. Okay, so our man in black, the prosecutor goes, on Monday, October 20th, Dennis appeared before Superior Court on his attorney's motion to withdraw from his obligation to represent the defendant for the purposes of sentencing. The grounds for the attorney's motion, as I understand them, so this is a true fact, huh? Or an assumption presumption. Was that Dennis was refusing to follow the attorney's advice. And Dennis was directing the attorney to file motions and legal documents that the attorney believed had no valid legal basis. The court granted the attorney's motion to withdraw from the case. This will, in all likelihood, as I explained to the court, further delay the sentencing. Excuse me? Why is there no sentencing? We don't have a defendant to sentence. The defendant is dead. 
and nobody's taking on his position. And the guy that's attributed to be in harmony with the defendant has separated himself from the defendant and by the most part attempts to be an honor to all of the public officials. Now, notice there was an allegation to the best of the prosecutor's knowledge that the reason the attorney was put off the case was because of the dishonor of Dennis. Do we know, in fact, that that's true or false? Well, sure we know. What fact do we know that proves it's false? No, no, that's the other case. You're con- it's not. This guy talked to the attorney all the time. Told him what to do. Never criticized him for not doing anything. How do we know that, the attor- that he was not in dishonor to his attorney in this matter? I gave you a fact. The attorney, the attorney said he'd help privately after publicly he was excused by the court. Now, if the attorney was in dishonor, he would not have the capacity to volunteer to help the guy. So we know that his own attorney that moved to be let go on the public side was not in that position because of a dishonor by Dennis. Go ahead. So in spite of all my scripts and my paperwork, when the guy offered to help, that meant that I was still in honor. You're still in honor, yep. Otherwise, he'd have no capacity come back and offer to do something for you. Okay? So, why is this man in black? Why is this prosecutor writing this letter? Another test. Another test. Not only that, they are somewhat embarrassed by the long delay in sentencing in this case. Let's see, August, September, October. We're 60 days now. End of November is 90 days. They're not even going to have a psychiatric uh, forensic test until the middle of January, that will be 145 days. 135 days. That would be the earliest possible time they could go to sentencing if they do. Okay? So he's trying to create a public record of illusion to conceal the true black and white truth of what's going on here. Plus, it's a test for our hero again. Throw out as much venom as you can and see what happens. What happened with the attorney for that guy in Wisconsin when he called up on the phone and the, and the patriot from Wisconsin said, excuse me, are you going to file those documents? And the attorney came back and said, are you crazy? Those documents are stupid. Why does the attorney say that? It's a test. It's only a test. There's too much reality in those documents. You've got the procedure down right. We can't allow the court to acknowledge what you're doing and let the cat out of the bag so that the public will be teaching everybody else the reality of the truth. So I work for the public. I will give you backwards the lie. Um, When I was talking with Lee on my case, he said time is on my side. So are we saying we just stay in honor and wait him out? Absolutely. Time is always on the side of those people are good. Remember, the bad always rush to judgment because they're hoping to do something before the good know what they're doing or learn the procedure or what they're up to. So he goes on, the court directed the Patriot to go to the public defender's office to determine whether they would agree to represent him. Parentheses, which seems unlikely since he apparently has a joint interest in a house and presumably a job ending parentheses. What just happened here? The court directed 
our hero to go to the public defender's office to determine whether they would agree to represent him. Beginning parenthesis, which seems unlikely since he apparently has a joint interest in a house and presumably a job, ending parenthesis. He was then told to report to the Delaware State Hospital for an evaluation to determine his mental competency to be sentenced. That evaluation is to be completed within 45 days. What just happened? Yeah, anything in parenthesis is not there. So whether or not the public defender's office is going to defend them has nothing to do with the fact that the defendant has a half interest in a house and a job. Don't you understand that these people understand what's going on? Yeah, anything in a bracket, a box, or a parenthesis is not there. It's irrelevant and immaterial. You think that this prosecutor is charging him so he can't get a public defender? He goes, well, it's speculation whether a job and a house and any other assets would keep it away, but I ain't charging him since it's not my letter because it's in a bracket. So it ain't here. Don't you have a clue that these people know exactly what they're doing? Third paragraph, it is my opinion who gives a rat's ass other than the fact that we don't want to dishonor this guy. You understand? His opinion is irrelevant. It is my opinion that the underlying reason that the judge sent the Patriot to the state hospital was his recent attempt to avoid responsibility for his actions modeled on some programs outlined by anti-government extremist groups and published on the internet. These attempts appear to be nonsensical and resulted in the Patriots' referral to the state hospital. Here you go. Opinions, outrageous claims. Last paragraph. I am continuing my research on whether this Patriot's actions are part of a scheme to protect any assets that he has and to avoid responsibility for his acts and will submit a memorandum to the court once I complete my research and confirm that my conclusions are accurate. Yeah, this prosecutor's as double-minded as can be, but then he's in the public. He should be a little insane. Last sentence. I will keep you advised of any further developments. Very truly yours, the Deputy Attorney General in this case, of this state. Okay? Now, understand what's going on here. He's turned it absolutely backwards. Because Dennis came in and said, I am authorizing the use of my exemption to pay all claims and all liabilities. Does that sound to you like he's trying to evade and avoid responsibility? No. Okay, but you've got to turn that around backwards. Otherwise, everybody will start believing the reality of the truth. Everybody understand that what the documentation and paperwork shows coming back to Dennis is predictable and right on point to everything that we've been teaching and saying. They're dancing right in line with him, but since they're his partner, they are the mirror image of everything he does and says. He takes responsibility, they interpret it as irresponsibility because they are the mirror image of the dance partner. They're the opposite. That's what's going on. Okay? Third example. I have a friend of mine down south. He has been involved in an IRS 
case and situation in which there were some trusts involved. And where there's trust involves, involved with patriots, most of the time, the problems that we have with patriots and trusts is that the patriots' trusts generally are never registered and recorded on the public side. Because somewhere back in their history, they started learning that when you register the trust, then the government has the control claim over the trust. So they go, hey man, I want to keep my property. I don't want to give it to the government, so I'm not going to publicly register my trust. And then they convey their assets into the trust. Now, when the IRS comes along and looks at these transactions, what generally transpires is the IRS looks at the trust, usually non-registered, and looks at where the assets had come from that were in the trust, and the assets generally came from the patriot that was associated with setting up, creating the trust, or at least transferring the assets in there. And so the IRS immediately generally ignores everything that the trust did. It doesn't make any difference whether it's got a tax identification number or not. It doesn't make any difference whether the trust filed tax returns or not. Generally, the IRS attributes all the assets in the trust as the alter ego of the straw man of the patriot and just purports to authorize the patriot to, off, to, to allow the IRS to reschedule all the tax liabilities as though it was a liability belonging to the individual straw man, the mirror image of the tax of the patriot, and the IRS assumes and presumes that's the tax liabilities and goes about assessing, leaning, collecting, doing whatever, totally ignoring the trust. Why do they do that? No second witness when they didn't register it? Why? Well, I don't care if there's a second witness or not. What legal authority does the United States have to assume and presume that the property is alter ego property and tax it as though it was an alter ego property? It's all liability stuff. Well, yeah, but, you know, there could be liability stuff in Spain, too. The U.S. doesn't tax the liability stuff in Spain. Why would they tax this? Because after all, if this trust is not registered, this trust is foreign. And if this trust is foreign, then it's not domestic. And if it isn't domestic, do they have jurisdiction over the assets in that trust any more than they would have jurisdiction over another foreign trust, like a trust or like people in Spain or South Africa or the Middle East. And if they believe they have jurisdiction over the assets in the trust, what's the legal theory upon which they've got that jurisdiction so they can make that assumption to proceed? Your dishonor? No. Not necessarily. If you're a foreigner making money in country, then it's liable to that. If you're a foreign maker money in a country, then you have it. Well, I thought under 871, if you're a foreigner, you could file as a foreigner. You know, there is this public attorney that says that this guy named Smith is a lunatic by the rule of 93 because he's never heard of it before and he believes this guy named Smith just made that up, this rule of 93. But what did this lunatic Smith say the rule of 93 purported? It's 
1793, by the way. Uh, the attorney that claims that he's never heard of it, I accept that as a true fact. He was probably right. Probably never heard of what he didn't hear. And he thinks that Smith made it up. I accept that as a true fact. That's what he really thinks. And there's many, everything else the attorney said is a true fact too. But since everything shows his ignorance and conclusional law, I don't know whether he wants me to argue with the lunatic or not. So I don't think I will. I'll just accept every fact he said was true. Anybody that knows Qui Tam understands that Qui Tam does all kinds of research, and Qui Tam is the one that did the research in the history on the Rule of 93. I'm not claiming any credit for that. But the Rule of 93 was very interesting. It basically said that if someone deals commercially with a debtor to a creditor, that the person X who deals with the debtor to creditor A becomes also a debtor to creditor A. Aren't all the assets belonging to the debtor there for the privity and enjoyment of the creditor to discharge the liability? So if any third party comes in and tries to exchange, <coughs> transact, do business with a debtor and move the so-called debtor's assets away from the debtor, the rule of 93 simply says you can't play that game without the creditor's okay. Otherwise, the debtor could get rid of all of his really, really, really good assets by claiming to make trades with a third party leaving the creditor, creditor holding the bag. So the rule of 93 is a very logical commercial rule. It says if there's a debtor there indebted to a creditor and he goes out and does business with you, you better be very careful because you're doing business with that debtor to this other creditor A, authorizes the creditor of A to come in and look over your transactions. And whatever it is you got out of the deal could be subject to go back to the creditor based on a fraud. So let's look at it this way. All the Patriots straw men, they were trying to get all their assets out of harm's way with the IRS, right? So they set up these trusts, right? And these trusts are all foreign unregistered trusts. They're like foreign creditors. And the debtor did what with this foreign trust? Turned over all the so-called assets to the unregistered foreign trust, didn't they? What did that just do to the creditor of the straw man of the patriot? Well, just allegedly got rid of all of the collectible assets that the creditor could have come against. But since the unregistered trust is a foreign third party, under the rule of 93, what does that authorize the creditor to do? Come after the foreign unregistered trust as though it were an alter ego of the debtor. So under the rule of 93, which the Patriot attorney thinks is stupid, doesn't exist, and has been a creation made up by Smith, it's extremely logical extension of commercial transactions, number one. And number two, it absolutely tells you why the IRS is treating all of these foreign unregistered trusts as all their egos under the rule of 93. All of their assets are subject to the creditor which the IRS represents. It's a cosigner. It's somebody that butted into the business of the creditor and therefore the creditor doesn't need his consent. By butting into the business of the creditor, he's given it. 
Now, the IRS doesn't want to let the cat out of the bag, so they just treat it as an alter ego and go after it, okay? Yes, Donna? Uh, we had friends that we uh, loaned money and on a house situation that they were just generally getting under more debt, and they then in turn got behind to the bank for several payments, and the bank took them to, um, well, in the process of taking them to the court, we got paperwork <clears throat> from the bank's lawyer that put us on the same side of the ledger as our friends. And, of course, the letter <laughs> said that unless you uh, return some paperwork, you're going to lose forever any claim on this property. Is that basically what had happened there? Yeah, basi basically the debtor came did business with you and the creditors coming back going, hello, you better show us or prove to us where whatever it is you're claiming, you have a right of your own volition to separate that from the debtor's property or we'll just assume you and the debtor have merged together and when we come after the debtor, we're basically coming after you at least within a certain boundary because it looks like you and the debtor were basically in in harmony in this transaction which prejudices the credit. Interestingly enough, about a year later, I forget what we were doing, but somebody did a credit check on us evidently and we were denied something and when we went back and just stormed at them until they finally told us it was because of that um, mm -hmm. bank coming after our friends and us ending up on the same in the same pile of problem that they were in. Yeah, let me show you how this exists in a bigger scheme. This is why the Patriot Attorney doesn't want you to understand this. The national federal government was the one who took out the loan to the international bankers. So they were liable on the loan. Were the states involved? No. Were the people involved? No. Okay. Then the Constitutional Convention came down and the states signed the Constitution, which was the mortgage document. By signing the Constitution, the mortgage document, who was now involved as the debtor? States and the national government. Were the people involved? No. When the states got to the point where they told the inhabitants to start registering their titles with the states, did they merge? Rule of 93, the people now became liable for the debt, which is why in 1933, all the people that registered were now merging their business practice with the debtors and became liable for the debt. Rule 93. That's why the attorney doesn't want you to understand the implications of what happened. Now, are you really saying then, as far as trusts are concerned, that we should not have any trusts no. that are unregistered? No. Nope. Don't jump off the bridge with the baby. There's nothing wrong with trusts appropriately done. I'm saying that these unregistered trusts basically were foreign, and where did the unregistered trust get their assets? From debtors. From debtors. Had the people not been debtors, gotten out of debt first, then established the trust and transferred the properties into the trust unregistered, that would have been cool. But they did it backwards. See, everybody's doing everything backwards. God tells you to do it one way and we look at what he tells us to do and we go from the first last to the last first. We do it backwards and that's the wrong sequence in which to do it. That way you get in trouble. So I had to tell you what was going on with trust so that when I described to you what's going on with my buddy here, it will make sense to you as to what the background is that's happening. Those unregistered trusts are, in, in a sense, a surety. They, be, they become like a surety. They become a surety, actually, for the property that they've assumed that belonged to the debtor, so now they're underwriting the debtor. That's another way of putting 
the rule of 93. That the creditor, a foreign creditor, by dealing with the debtor becomes a surety for that debtor. Okay? Pete. Okay, now I'm confused. I thought well, we good. agreed a lot. We're making accomplishments then. <laughs> I, I thought we agreed some time ago that you didn't want to own anything and you wanted to control it. So that raises a question in my mind of why would you want to attempt to have a trust which is essentially, supposedly it isn't your stuff, but in reality the trusts are set up so that you ultimately control or tell it. It's a friendly trustee, a cooperative trustee. Uh, it seems to me that if you're working down the vein of having a trust, then you're kind of going counter to the... No, 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 no. It has no? Nothing, it, this has nothing to do with trustee. This has to do with the loot from the bank robbery. A trust is perfectly viable and does everything a trust is supposed to do. But you don't put the proceeds from the bank robbery into the trust and think you've isolated it and you're going to get away with it. It's not the trust. It's where the assets that are in the trust came from. And they came from the bankruptcy before they were removed from the bankruptcy. Everybody understand what the problem is here? It has nothing to do with trust. The IRS is not attacking trust. They're attacking the fact that the trusts are attempting to remove assets from the warehouse of the creditors and trying to disassociate the title from those creditors' warehouse assets so that it appears as though the trust has complete authority and control over assets that are basically stolen from the creditor. That's the issue. You understand? So it's not a discussion about the validity of trust. It's a discussion, if anything, about how does a trust get good title to assets to maintain its separation and its unique control. You can't steal the assets from the creditor by shifting them over and then try to convince the creditor that he hasn't got control of the assets you stole out of his warehouse from his straw men. I don't think I can put it any clearer than that. Everybody understand what the IRS assumption is here? They assume you stole the assets from the warehouse belonging to the creditor and you're trying to not pay tax on it, and you're trying to argue you don't owe a tax because the trust is not a citizen of the United States. That's true. It just happens to be dealing in stolen goods. Don? Then all of this information has no particular application to the fact of what we discussed a year ago, and that is sticking my house in a trust. Go on and do it. Just don't expect it to be free of the real estate taxes. Well, absolutely not, because putting it in a trust, it still belongs to the creditor unless you've taken steps. And the credit, the the property tax on the house is the trustee fee for maintaining the trusteeship over the house. The fact that you took it out of a straw man's name and put it in a trust name is irrelevant. You just put it in a different vessel. The vessel still sails in the fleet belonging to the creditor. I heard Stone on a tape in regards to land patents say that um, he didn't really go on to much detail, but he did make the statement that trusts have no rights. Does that have any implication? A to trust is a contract. A contract can't have rights. Parties to the contracts might. And it depends on the, the contract itself and the relationship between the parties. And it depends on the standing and character of the parties and where they got their goods and what they've done to either isolate, maintain them, or merge them with other interests. So it's complicated, or could be. 
Okay, so this guy had a non-registered trust and he conveyed some property into the trust. When he conveyed property into the trust, he claims it's not his straw man's anymore and he claimed that when they came against him for taxes, that the trust basically was not him and, and owed no taxes and whatever. Anyway, this is one of those rare cases in which the IRS did not choose to charge him criminally. But it went against him civilly. Very interesting. And in this civil case against him and the trusts, which they just said the trust was an alter ego, they don't look at the trust as being an entity or anything at all. They're looking at him. They went along and they rearranged the taxes and in the bottom line they say, and so you, you owe us like $60,000. Okay? Now, this guy was fighting, 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 fighting. Then he was doing conditional acceptances. I will if you prove. I will if you prove. I will if you prove. And finally he goes, oh, hell with it. I'll pay the tax. Here's the bill of exchange. Okay? Now remember, there's a civil case going. Now, he went back and when they sued him civilly, he just accepted all of the complaint for value, returned it for value, asked for settlement and closure, and extended to them basically a bill of exchange or a check on a closed account or something or other like that, okay? So that went back to these people. And uh, lo and behold, the process has been going on and on for months, and they can't, the United States came back with a motion for summary judgment. Now, they didn't come back with a motion for default, even though he never filed a, quote, civil answer. A summary judgment is treated legally different than a default judgment. A default judgment is a judgment that is basically not on the presumed merits of the case. And a default judgment can actually be relitigated because res judicata does not set in. Res judicata is a judicial maxim or principle that says once decided, always decided. Which makes sense in law, but in equity anything's possible and we can re-decide the case as many times as we want because who's paying any attention to the law and the maxim? But under res judicata, it says once decided, always decided. So if you get a motion for summary judgment and you lose that judgment, the court has presumed to have found the case on the merits or on the substance of the case. And it can never be relitigated unless there is some substantive violation that would require it to be redone because there was some substantive right denied. So when the United States came back for a summary judgment against all the defendants, it says, we want to have a judgment in this case on the merits. That is, do we get a judgment for $60,000 for taxes due and owing? And so they put in that motion for summary judgment and our hero, if the rule is if you don't respond to a motion for summary judgment, it's assumed and presumed you've agreed to it and if the motion for summary judgment contains all the necessary elements to be brought forth for a summary judgment, it's presumed to be unopposed and will be granted as long as all the elements are present. So when the motion for summary judgment came in, our hero came back and he just took his copy and went accepted for value, return for value, request settlement and closure and apply the exemption, the bill of exchange for adjustment, offset, closure and release the order to me. 
if you respond to a motion for summary judgment and there is evidence against you, you cannot merely respond by argument. You must put in evidence of rebuttal. And if you fail by the rules of evidence to rebut, even though your arguments are incredibly logical, if there was any evidence in support of the motion for summary judgment and you have not responded by evidence in rebuttal, your argument is useless because the judgment is based on evidence and the scales of justice weigh the evidence. An argument does not go on the scale and the most eloquent argument will not be evidence to balance the scale. So if the other side even puts a whisper of evidence, an affidavit, scale goes down in their favor and you put only argument in, too bad, you lose. There was no evidence to balance the scale or tip it in your favor. So this guy put in no affidavits and no evidence. He just said, I accept for value, return for value, ask for settlement and closure. Now, why did he do that? Because to argue is a dishonor. Because all tax schemes are illusions. And if you argue an illusion, it becomes reality. So all he can do is, hey, whatever you believe, whatever you think, you think it's 60000 go ahead, use my exemption and get rid of it. Every time you argue, you lose no matter how eloquent your argument. You lose because you're in a dishonor by arguing because you're going to war with your brother instead of settling. So he put nothing in. And he's saying to me, gee, you think this is cool? I go, yeah. I said, you told him to settle it, right? You were in agreement that you would allow the exemption to pay the 60000 right? He goes, yeah. I says, how in the world is your bill of exchange going to pay the judgment of 60, or, or the, the bill of 60000 Where does the consideration come in your bill of exchange? What makes that consideration? Well, it is a prepaid account, but does that mean you can go out and write bills of exchange and buy Cadillacs or anything you want? Taj Mahal? Queen Elizabeth? Why can't you write a bill of exchange to do that? You need a pre-existing debt. If you don't have a pre-existing debt, a pre-existing payment is irrelevant. Yeah, an invoice invoices the, the evidence is the pre-existing debt. So the consideration in your prepaid account only becomes visible to the public world when they produce a pre-existing debt. Now the IRS says we owe sixty thousand or our hero owes sixty thousand, okay? Give me an invoice. And they go, Well, you know, we sent you this, we sent you that. We're in court now. What is going to evidence that debt once they're in court? A judgment of the court evidences that debt. So when does his bill of exchange become good for that debt? When the judgment of the court comes out, second witness ratifying that it's a 60,000 debt. Now, this guy goes into court and he says, I accept those charges for value, I return them for value, and I want you to settle and close it. And they go, patience, my lad, we're not there yet. And he already sent them a bill of exchange. And they're looking at the bill of exchange and going, what the hell is this? And what does it mean? And where does it come from? And like, we haven't even got a debt yet. They need to get the judgment to have the second ratification of the debt so that it makes good the consideration in the bill of exchange. So I said to this guy, you want that summary judgment to come now. Because the summary judgment is the second witness in the ratification that there is a debt making the consideration in your bill of exchange good to close it and discharge it. Does that make sense to anybody? 
That's the public witness. Now, look at the beauty of it. You're dancing with these people saying, hey, whatever you say, just do what you're going to do, settle and close it. Okay? Now, if you stop, start fighting with them in every step of the dance proceedings so that they can't do what you've asked them to do, then you're like this guy in, in Wisconsin saying to the attorney, well, I told you to do that. You didn't do it. You're ineffective. Beep. You're telling public officials in Disneyland what's logical and how to carry out their job. What's wrong with this picture? You're not in Disneyland. They are. There's nothing logical in Disneyland. And if you tell them how to do their job in Disneyland, what have you just become in fact? A public official operating in Disneyland to help resolve the issues in Disneyland. You become the public debtor 